In my now many years of studying the pathogens that lurk within the shadows of our world, I have encountered horrors that would shake the foundations of modern science were they to be widely published. I have documented the insidious human vampiric virus, which transforms its victims into blood-hungry predators with heightened senses and near immortality. I have also observed the terrifying effects of the lycanthropic parvovirus, which twists human bodies into bestial lupine forms. Each of these viruses on its own presents a significant threat to humanity and our understanding of biology. But now, my valued listener, I must present to you a new phenomenon, one so disturbing that I hesitated to even bring it about for observation, the co-infection of HVV and LPV in a single host. In this study, I will detail my observations of individuals unfortunate enough to fall victim to both viruses, neither fully vampire nor completely werewolf, but something else. I only ask that you withhold judgment as to my methods. In a world where such pernicious diseases not only exist, but seem to be spreading more rapidly than at any point in human history, some sacrifices cannot be avoided. We have discussed the individual effects of both HVV and LPV in previous volumes, but in the interest of thoroughness, allow me a moment to summarize each disease respectively. The human vampiric virus is a member of the order Mononega virales. It penetrates nearly every cell in the human body, sparing only the red blood cells, acting swiftly and largely silently. Indeed, its speed is remarkable with victims succumbing to its influence within a mere 6 to 12 hours of infection. Transmission occurs primarily through the exchange of bodily fluids, most commonly through the bite of an infected individual. The hallmark of this virus is the vampiric coma, a day-long period of active unconsciousness during which the host undergoes a disturbing metamorphosis. Upon awakening, the victim's strength and reflexes are enhanced, and their brain essentially rewired granting quadrochromatic vision that extends into the near-infrared spectrum, but at the trade-off of extreme photosensitivity. Victims of HVV also experience a fundamental shift in metabolism. Due to the effects of the virus, such victims lose the ability to synthesize a crucial protein found only in hominids, and they find themselves driven to consume both human blood and flesh. In exchange, the virus offers its host virtual immortality, continuously regenerating cells, staving off aging for astonishingly long periods of time. The lycanthropic parvovirus also reshapes its victims, but the process is far more prolonged and agonizing. This DNA virus, a distant cousin to the parvovirus that afflicts common household pets, likely began in canines before mutating in a way that allowed it to infect humans, and in doing so, brought along a suite of genes that fundamentally alter the human body plan. The initial stages of LPV infection manifest over a day, but this is only the beginning of a roughly six-week ordeal of excruciating transformation. As part of this horrifying process, bones elongate and reshape, muscles hypertrophy, and the facial structure is entirely altered, eventually coming to resemble a canine muzzle. The virus also triggers widespread hypertrichosis, while the senses, particularly hearing and smell, are deeply enhanced. Shortly after initial infection, higher brain functions begin to deteriorate, leaving the victim a slave to primal instincts and uncontrollable aggression, while circadian rhythms are completely flipped. The result is an aggressive, quadrupedal beast that is scarcely recognizable as having once been human. <clears throat> as documented in previous volumes, thanks to a connection of mine somehow unstrained due to the events of the past few years, I managed to obtain access to a decrepit, though isolated and secure, facility for testing. Though it is an advantage to utilize such a facility, I have grown to hate it. My only solace is the necessity of these studies and the hope that it will all soon be over. It took more time than in previous studies to find suitable individuals for observation. This is in part due to the fact that I anticipated that a co-infection of HVV and LPV would take a heavy toll on even the healthiest participants. But also, given the mortality rates of LPV in particular, 
I knew that we'd need a far larger sample size than normal. Though I believe that such occurrences will only become more frequent, at this time, the natural co-infection of HVV and LPV in a single individual is quite rare. Indeed, it likely requires the alignment of several circumstances, of which I have identified at least two. First, there is the highly unlikely scenario of simultaneous infection, wherein the unfortunate victim receives bites from both a vampire and an LPV-infected organism, human or otherwise, within a short time frame, typically less than an hour. Second, and more likely, is a sequential infection, wherein a host infected with one virus encounters a carrier of the other before the first virus's transformative process is complete. I made the decision to form the phases of my study around these two primary scenarios, beginning with the second. We've discussed many creatures once thought to be mere legend, but throughout history perhaps none have captured the imagination so strongly as the dragon. What if they too were more than fantasy, real flesh and blood organisms adapted for unique environments across the earth? This video is brought to you by Dragonatomy, an in-depth field guide to the biology of dragons, and it's now available on Kickstarter. Dragonatomy will take you on a visual journey with more than 100 gorgeous, hand-drawn illustrations of more than 25 unique species of dragon, each with their own natural history, from frost-breathing dragons to volcanic behemoths. Along the way, you'll have even your most complex biological questions answered, from how dragons achieve flight to how they breathe fire, all with full anatomical illustrations. You'll also learn about how these dragons fit into their ecosystems, a fascinating study all on its own. Really, it's like a biology textbook, but one you'll actually enjoy reading and one that would make a much more interesting conversation piece on your coffee table. Speaking of tables, for those of you who enjoy tabletop RPGs, by supporting the Dragon Anatomy Kickstarter, you'll also receive a 5e compatible stat book, so you can populate your world with living dragons. So be sure to check out Dragon Anatomy on Kickstarter today to support this book and secure your seat on a scientific exploration into the world of dragons. Link is in the description. The first stage was the first of many challenges this entire study faced. The potential for extreme suffering and high mortality rates weighed heavily on my conscience, yet the importance of understanding these co-infections compelled me. But you have likely grown weary of my personal musings, so let us proceed. Through our usual channels, over the course of the study, we managed to secure a group of 40 subjects, all between the ages of 25 and 40, and of appropriate physical condition. I divided the subjects into two equal groups. Group A to be first infected by HVV, followed by the introduction of LPV, and Group B with LPV as the primary infection, followed by HVV. Each group was further subdivided to allow for varying intervals between the primary and secondary infections, ranging from 6 hours to 5 days. The study began with the controlled exposure of Group A to the human vampiric virus. As expected, within 6 to 12 hours, all subjects exhibited the typical early symptoms, high fever, severe thirst, and elevated heart rate. The lycanthropic virus was introduced to the first subgroup at the 12-hour mark, and the interaction between the viruses was immediate and violent. Three subjects did not survive the first few hours, their bodies unable to withstand the conflict between the viruses, with the cardiovascular system showing catastrophic failure as the heart struggled to adapt. Now, in a traditional HVV infection, the vampiric coma that follows the infection is a state of active unconsciousness. There is clearly an internal turmoil, but it could be construed as a feverish delirium similar to that observed in other, more common infections. In the subjects of this group, however, the vampiric coma was far worse. Their bodies contorted in unnatural ways, muscles spasming beneath the skin, and most alarmingly, several subjects regained brief moments of terrified consciousness during this period before lapsing back into comatose states. The second subgroup, infected with LPV at the 24-hour mark just as they were emerging from the vampiric coma, fared marginally better. The immediate mortality rate was lower, with only one subject expiring in the first few hours. However, the following transformation process, exacerbated by LPV, was no less horrifying. The result was a grotesque exhibition of partially transformed vampires experiencing rapid and agonizing lycanthropic changes. Their elongated, more gracile limbs thickened and twisted, while limited hypertrichosis grew in asymmetrical patterns across the body. 
the final subgroup, exposed to LPV five days after HVV infection, presented yet another variation in outcomes. These subjects, having completed their vampiric transformation, initially appeared resistant to LPV's effects. However, as days passed, these subjects began to exhibit a blend of vampiric and lycanthropic traits. Their once graceful forms became more robust, with increased muscle mass and bone density. Facial features began to elongate slightly, though not to the extent seen in pure lycanthropic transformations. Among all groups, HVV's enhancement of fast-twitch muscle fibers, combined with LPV's stimulation of protein synthesis, resulted in extreme muscle growth. It was obvious, however, that the subject's nervous system struggled to regulate such rapid changes, which led to extended periods of overstimulation. And because the nervous system had not fully adapted to the increased motor control required by this muscle growth, most subjects experienced involuntary spasms, as one might expect to see in traditional HVV infection, though far more pronounced. Finally, metabolically speaking, subjects were in a state of constant demand. Indeed, nutritional requirements fluctuated wildly between subjects and within individuals, creating a sense of perpetual hunger. Some subjects began to experience muscle wasting and signs of internal organ stress when their needs were not met quickly enough. As this phase of the study progressed, it became increasingly clear that the interaction between HVV and LPV was far more complex than even that of our previous studies. Indeed, these viruses seem to be vying for dominance within the host's body, resulting in a transformation process more prolonged and agonizing than either virus produces alone, and with a disturbingly high mortality rate. By the end of the first week, 40% of Group A were tragically deceased, with the remainder in various states of agonizing transformation. After some time, we began our study of the next group, Group B, which was to encompass an LPV primary infection, followed by that of HVV. As with Group A, we subdivided Group B to allow for varying intervals between infections. 24 hours, 72 hours, and 7 days post-initial LPV exposure. The results were, to put it mildly, chaotic. The first subgroup, exposed to HVV just 24 hours after LPV infection, experienced the highest mortality rate of all test groups. The introduction of HVV at this early stage of lycanthropic transformation simply seemed to create too high a level of physiological stress. Of the six subjects in this subgroup, four expired within hours of HVV exposure. Autopsy results of these unfortunate subjects revealed, if you'll pardon the informal terminology, a cellular battleground. Observed samples seem to indicate that LPV's initial alterations to the genome created a hostile environment for HVV's typical mode of infection. In response, HVV seemed to adapt. Indeed, we observed an amplified level of virulence which, in turn, led to rapid and widespread cell death, particularly in the liver and kidneys, and which ultimately resulted in total organ failure. The two surviving subjects from this subgroup underwent a terrible transformation wherein the gradual reshaping of bones characteristic of LPV infection accelerated dramatically, so much so that fractures within the bone were audible. Most notably, these subjects never entered the vampiric coma. Instead, they remained in a state of agonized consciousness throughout the entire process, their screams eventually devolving into inhuman howls that seemed to echo through the facility for days. The second subgroup, exposed to HVV 72 hours after LPV infection, experienced a higher rate of survival. By this point, the initial stages of the lycanthropic transformation were well underway, with subjects exhibiting increased muscle mass, the beginnings of facial elongation, and patches of thick hair growth. The introduction of HVV at this stage created a visible conflict in the transformation process. In some areas of the body, the lycanthropic changes continued unaltered, while in others, the influence of HVV seemed to overtake it. As was observed in the co-infection of lycanthropy and the zombism virus, this resulted in a bizarrely asymmetrical development. The final subgroup, infected with HVV a full week after LPV exposure, presented yet another variation in outcomes. These subjects, well into their lycanthropic transformation, appear to resist HVV infection, though it is difficult to ascertain whether this is because LPV outpaces the viral war for resources, so to speak, or whether the changes brought on by HVV were simply lost among the larger changes wrought by the lycanthropic virus. This particular outcome may warrant further testing. 
By the conclusion of this phase of the study, the survival rate in Group B mirrored that of Group A, with only 60% of subjects surviving. However, the expressions of the co-infection varied wildly between individuals, and regarding consistency of the interaction of these viruses, little has been determined fully. While there were many observable differences in each of the groups, there were many things that I do consider consistent in this variety of co-infection, at least enough to warrant an overview of certain symptoms and outcomes. For example, among many subjects, the most dramatic alterations seem to occur in the skeletal and muscular systems. In Group A subjects, it appears that the initial HVV infection triggered the production of parathyroid hormone-related protein, which typically results in the gracile elongation of bones. LPV, on the other hand, typically activates dormant osteoclasts and chondrocytes in the epiphyseal plates, leading to rapid bone resorption and reformation. In the co-infected subjects, it appears that this process was moderated by the pre-existing HVV changes. The result was a unique bone structure, longer than typical lichens due to the initial HVV elongation, but denser and more robust due to LPV's influence on bone mineralization. Group B subjects experienced a different progression. The initial LPV infection triggered rapid bone growth and restructuring as expected, but when HVV was introduced, it appeared to interfere with LPV's osteogenic processes, particularly in the facial bones. This interference resulted in a less pronounced muscle shape compared to pure lichens, as HVV's influence seemed to partially counteract the extreme elongation of the maxilla and mandible. Furthermore, muscular hypertrophy in both groups exceeded what is typically observed in either pure vampires or lichens. HVV normally increases the proportion of fast-twitch muscle fibers and enhances mitochondrial efficiency, while LPV triggers widespread protein synthesis and the proliferation of muscle cells. In co-infected subjects, these processes appear to compound each other. The enhanced mitochondrial function allows for greater energy production, fueling the excessive protein synthesis and cell proliferation. Additionally, the increased fast-twitch fiber ratio is maintained even as overall muscle mass grows, resulting in subjects with both extreme speed and strength. But perhaps the most intriguing changes occurred in the circulatory system. In Group A subjects, the initial HVV infection began the process of cardiac atrophy and the transition to skeletal muscle-driven circulation. However, the introduction of LPV, which typically causes cardiac hypertrophy due to the increased metabolic demands of the lichen form, disrupted this process. In co-infected subjects, this led to a partial reversal of the HVV-induced cardiac atrophy. In some cases, the result was a hybrid circulatory system where both cardiac and skeletal muscles contributed to blood flow. But while this dual-driven circulation appears to move blood throughout the body quite well, it also led the subjects to bouts of fluctuating, uncontrollable spasms, far worse than the tremors experienced by vampires. Olfactory capabilities were universally enhanced beyond levels seen in pure infections of either virus, which appears to be due to a combination of HVV's enhancement of olfactory bulb sensitivity and LPV's enlargements of the olfactory cortex. However, this hypersensitivity often caused distress due to sensory overload. At this point, we've discussed at length the changes observable at the macro level. But of course, these outcomes are the result of what occurs at the cellular level. HVV, as an RNA virus, typically infects cells through endocytosis and alters cellular function to produce viral clones without immediate cell destruction. LPV, a DNA virus, integrates its genome directly into the host cell's DNA. In co-infected cells, these processes appear to interfere with each other. HVV's alterations to cellular metabolism seem to make it more difficult for LPV to successfully integrate its genome. Conversely, in cells where LPV has already integrated, HVV's replication is often impaired. This cellular conflict results in a patchwork of differently affected tissues throughout the body, explaining the often asymmetrical and variable nature of the transformations observed. It also likely contributes to the high mortality rate, as the competing viral processes place enormous stress on cellular function. The resulting creatures possess strengths and abilities that exceed those of either vampires or lichens alone, but also suffer from instabilities and weaknesses unique to their condition. The implications of such creatures existing in the world are, to put it mildly, deeply troubling. The next phase of the study was a natural progression, 
and some months later my assistant and I began the arduous task of procuring yet another sample. We selected 30 subjects, again focusing on individuals between 25 and 40 years of age, all in good physical condition. This time, all subjects were to be infected with both viruses simultaneously. To achieve this, I prepared a solution containing both HVV and LPV in equal concentrations. The solution was administered via injection to ensure precise dosage and timing. Within two hours of administration, all subjects began exhibiting signs of severe physiological stress. The speed of this response was unprecedented, leading me to believe that a synergistic effect between the two viruses accelerated the initial stages of infection. During the first 12 hours, subjects experienced hyperpyrexia, likely the result of both viruses triggering separate immune responses and compounding the body's natural reaction. Cardiovascular instability was rampant, with subjects alternating between tachycardia exceeding 150 beats per minute and bradycardia dipping below 40 beats per minute. Furthermore, subjects reported intense, widespread pain deep in their tissues, which I suspect was due to the simultaneous onset of HVV's cellular alterations and LPV's aggressive tissue remodeling. Neurological symptoms were also prevalent, and seizures affected a majority of subjects within the first 12 hours. The metabolic impact was equally severe, manifesting in rapid weight loss. Unfortunately, the mortality rate during this initial phase was staggering. Within the first 24 hours, 8 of the 30 subjects expired, their bodies seemingly overwhelmed by the competing viral processes. Autopsies revealed severe cellular damage across multiple organ systems, with evidence of both HVV's more subtle alterations and LPV's more aggressive restructuring occurring simultaneously in many tissues. As the surviving subjects moved past the initial 24-hour period, greater variations in their transformations became apparent. Unlike in the study of sequential infection, here there was no clear pattern to the expression of vampiric or lycanthropic traits. Many subjects exhibited stark asymmetrical changes between the left and right sides of their bodies. One subject, for example, developed the elongated fingers characteristic of HVV infection on their left hand, while their right hand began to show signs of the thickening and claw-like nail growth associated with LPV. This physical dichotomy extended to other parts of the body, creating bizarrely mismatched features. Sensory abilities in the subjects fluctuated rapidly, and many were often severely disoriented. Some began to exhibit rapid hair growth, only to have it fall out hours later. Perhaps most disturbingly, subjects' cognitive functions seemed to oscillate between the heightened intellect associated with HVV and the more primal state induced by LPV. This led to periods of lucidity interspersed with bouts of feral behavior, often shifting rapidly and unpredictably. During their lucid moments, subjects often expressed horror and confusion at their condition, only to lose coherence mid-sentence as their minds were overwhelmed by more basal impulses. As the study progressed beyond the initial chaotic phase, the surviving subjects began to exhibit more stable, though no less disturbing, transformations. Of the 22 subjects who survived the first week, 18 remained alive after one month, each a unique amalgamation of vampiric and lycanthropic traits. The stabilization process itself was a harrowing experience for the subjects. Many experienced periods of intense pain as their bodies settled into their new forms. Bones creaked and shifted, muscles tore and regrew, and skin stretched and reshaped itself. Once again, the subject's agonized cries reverberated through the facility, each echo cutting to my soul. But eventually, the transformations did stabilize, and interestingly, as they did so, three distinct categories of hybrid beings emerged. I have termed them Alpha, Beta, and Gamma types. The Alpha types, comprising about 30% of the survivors, exhibited a predominance of vampiric traits. These subjects retained a more human-like appearance, with pale skin and elongated limbs characteristic of HVV infection. However, they also displayed some lycanthropic features, such as increased muscle mass and enhanced olfactory capabilities. Their eyes were perhaps their most striking feature, combining the hyperdilated pupils of the vampire with the gold coloration typical of lichens. Alpha types retained much of the heightened intelligence associated with vampires, but also exhibited periods of primal aggression more typical of lichens. These episodes were less frequent and severe than in other hybrid types, but when they occurred, the contrast with the subject's usually calculated demeanor was deeply unsettling. Beta types, making up approximately 40% of the survivors, 
represented a more even blend of vampiric and lycanthropic traits. These subjects underwent more extensive physical changes, developing a form that could be best described as a more sleek, predatory version of a lycan. They exhibited limited hypertrichosis, somewhat elongated jaws with pronounced canines, and partially digitigrade legs. However, they retained the graceful movement and pale skin tone associated with vampires. Cognitively, beta types were the most unstable. They oscillated between states of vampiric cunning and lycanthropic ferocity, sometimes shifting between the two in a matter of moments. This cognitive instability made them particularly dangerous and unpredictable. The gamma types, the remaining 30% of the survivors, leaned more heavily towards lycanthropic traits. These subjects underwent the most extreme physical transformations, developing a form more bestial than human, but retaining unsettling remnants of their humanity, such as less hair growth and less pronounced facial remodeling. They also appeared to exhibit some vampiric characteristics, such as increased speed and agility beyond that of typical lichens. Surprisingly, gamma types showed the most stable cognitive function, albeit at a level below human baseline. They seemed to settle into a state of primal cunning, combining the predatory instincts of lichens with a shadow of vampiric intelligence. One of the most intriguing findings across all types was related to the PCDH-Y protein. In pure HVV infections, the inability to synthesize this protein necessitates the consumption of human tissues. However, in our hybrid subjects, we observed varying levels of PCDH-Y synthesis capability. Alpha types reflected HVV victims' inability to synthesize the protein at all, while gamma types retained the ability at near normal levels. As a result, alpha types required the most human tissues, such as blood, in their diet, while gamma types, much like traditional lichens, were not picky at all though they certainly required many thousands of daily calories to meet their metabolic demands. Another interesting aspect of our hybrid subjects was their varied responses to the crucifix glitch, a phenomenon observed in vampires when intersecting right angles occupy more than 30 degrees of visual arc. Alpha types exhibited the strongest reaction to these right angles, experiencing disorientation and seizure-like episodes, though less severe than in pure HVV infections. Beta types exhibited a more muted response, displaying discomfort and agitation, but rarely progressing to full seizures. Gamma types showed the least reaction, with most exhibiting only momentary disorientation, if anything at all. I suspect that the varying degrees of susceptibility to the crucifix glitch among hybrid types is simply due to the level of predominance of vampiric traits in those types, particularly in regards to the visual cortex. I attribute the near immunity of gamma types to the glitch to the more extensive remodeling of brain structures by LPV, which likely bypasses the specific neural circuits responsible for the crucifix glitch in HVV infections. By the time these studies concluded, both my assistant and I were utterly exhausted, both physically and mentally. There is no solace from the horrors we've experienced, nor that of our subjects. There is no respite from the screams that still echo in my mind. There is only the small hope that this work will finally shed light on the threats that face all of humanity should these pathogens be disregarded as mere fiction. Indeed, the level of adaptability displayed in many of these subjects exceeds that of pure vampires or lichens, which would undoubtedly make predicting and countering their behaviors significantly more challenging. Worse, many hybrids exhibited resistance to traditional weaknesses of both vampires and lichens, which make them exceptionally difficult to control or eliminate. Indeed, we may see wild populations of intelligent lichens and hyper-aggressive vampires, either of which could accelerate the inevitable crisis these viruses would bring upon the greater population. As for myself, I no longer possess the resolve to continue studies of this magnitude. I've done what I can, and now the result is up to you, dear listener. Even the light of scientific discovery I so revere is growing dim, and the world is getting darker for it. I implore you to act now before that flame is extinguished forever.